Hi, everyone, and welcome to Be True, my podcast about the writing I love and the writing I do. I promise I won't rhyme the whole time. I'm John Tessitore, and today I'll be reading and discussing Dress Up, a poem from my new little book called Sometimes I Still Pray, a family album. You can find it and all my work at johntessitore.com. Sometimes I Still Pray is a collection about my family. Pictures, fiction, nonfiction, and poems. Ultimately, it's a book about love, passing generations, and mourning. And it includes a few poems that are surprisingly dark and strange and among my favorite that I've ever written. In that context, Dress Up could seem like lighter fare. It's written from a child's perspective about a trauma-free childhood memory and has a rhyme scheme, for God's sakes. But Dress Up is deceptive. Yes, it rhymes, but I stole the formal structure from James Merrill, a poet who often seems lighter than he really is. Ultimately, I think it's a pretty good introduction to the characters and concerns of Sometimes I Still Pray. Merrill wrote so many poems in the form I borrowed, with its A-B-B-A rhyme scheme. My favorite at the moment is a poem called Santo from his 1985 book Late Settings, That poem is about a statue of St. Francis of Assisi, a figure who makes several appearances in my own book. There were a lot of Franks and Francies running around in the Testatory clan, and a lot of little pictures of statues of balding men among birds. But rather than discuss that poem or its form in detail, I want to emphasize the thing I love most about Merrill. He was not ashamed to be a poet, to write poems with capital letters, to do things formally with rhyme and illusion, to be playful. His poems were, were aware of their own artifice. His best poems always feel honest to me because they don't pretend to be anything else. They love being poems, even the saddest among them. And Dress Up is a poem. In a way, it's a poem about transforming life or trying to, the act of writing and remembering for me as a poet today, and also about me as a kid, wearing someone else's clothes and imagining myself someone and somewhere else. It's about dreams and prayers. Dress up. My cue was the woody scent of cigar and the weft, the long tweed coat I tossed on the pile on my bed. Gentlemen's wear lost to fashion. The cloak of a character in a gangster film about the Brooklyn of yesteryear. Now another limp body in a boy's care. Summoning history while his elders murmured in the kitchen. In secret, I tried on his fedora and paraded around my bright bedroom, aped his accent, imagined gangland gloom, and a swell dame who danced the Balboa. Not my ovoid aunt, but a malt shop blonde with legs for the nightclubs and a smile that said stay, and so I stayed a while and lived my movie romance to the end. A hail of gunfire from a passing hearse. Clyde Barrow stood no chance, nor did Sonny Corleone, who didn't die for money but a moral code, however perverse. A romance that played on my sympathies as I stood before the mirror, deeming myself worthy of something more, dreaming a different future for suburban me. Even now I can recall everything about that evening, made a mental note of temptation, and filed this anecdote for another day. Still a boy wearing the memories of another man's clothes, my squat uncle and his fantasy mall, on the town, she in a shiny mink stall, he to his calf in the coat I'd still choose if I could return to that quiet night when I overheard him with my parents discussing the kind of disappointments that unmade men understand in hindsight. So that's a pretty good picture of what it was like to grow up in my house in Long Island. My parents were central to a large family, caretakers for both branches, and both branches were from Brooklyn. So there was a ton of driving, a ton of traffic. I spent way too much time of of my childhood on the Belt Parkway. Weekends, it was visit or be visited. I didn't play a lot of wiffle ball with friends during the weekends. And when they visited, often the best day of the weekend, the sunniest day in June... When we were finally home, they would show up unannounced, and there they were, and my father would curse, and we'd kick into hospitality mode. They were so old-fashioned. They had old cars. I don't know if you remember old cars. They had old cars. They had old cars with chrome and fins and tires with weird hubcaps. 
at a time when my family was piled into a plastic Oldsmobile. The men wore fedoras and chewed on cigars, at least some of them did, and they had that scent. Yes, mothballs, but also something I haven't smelled since. Something I associated with age and history, not unpleasant, but always startling. I I romanticized old people when I was a kid. They didn't deserve it, really. They weren't Sonny Corleone or Clyde Barrow. But they they fascinated me. I guess I was a born historian. So I liked being a part of the old person care team. I had my jobs. I'd accompany my dad on emergency runs to the five boroughs when there was a problem. Or less dramatically, I'd take their coats and throw them on the bed in my bedroom when they visited And then I'd eavesdrop as my parents solved their problems, physical, emotional, financial. The adult world seems so important to me and romantic, and I've had just about every one of those problems at this point, and they were not and are not romantic. But that's the lesson you learn as as an adult when you're an unmade man. At some point, you have to take off that fedora, John, and just admit that you're a kid from Long Island. And so I remain today. And with that happy thought, I conclude this first installment of Be True. If you've listened this long, thank you. You can find more about my work, including Sometimes I Still Pray, at johntessitori.com. And you can read Merrill's work in books like The Changing Light at Sandover, or my favorite, A Scattering of Salts. So maybe we'll talk again. In the meantime, i got to feed the dog. All right, Luna, I'm coming. <laughs>